Amen. Praise God. Well, last time we were together, we, we finished up on the rest of the story, if you will. That's what I called it, where uh, we will be inter- eternally in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, the book of Revelation, as you r- look at it, it just stops right there with um, chapter 22, and it tells us several times, I think three or four, behold, I come quickly, behold, I come quickly. <laughs> so... Come quickly, Lord. <laughs> come on, come on down. <laughs> Praise God. But it just kind of ends right there, and it doesn't really tell us what's going to happen when we do get to heaven and in the new heaven and the er- new earth. In the book of Revelation, it doesn't tell us that. But as I promised you, I have a timeline for the end times that you can use for yourself. Prayerfully, you got one, or you can. Uh, share it with with people who don't know, don't really understand the rest of the story because we're getting close to the end. And so it's important that we know what's coming down the pike, right? We need to know what's going on. So this will kind of help you with the timeline of certain things. Um, With respect to us, we know that the rapture is next in line and we're eagerly anticipating that. But we know that uh, we have a job to do before that point in time when, when God turns over and, and um, taps his son on the shoulder and says, go get my family. So you can look at this at another time. You can study it out. It's a recap of, of the things that we've studied in the past weeks. But I want you to know that there is a literal heaven where we as believers will go immediately um, when we pass. Now what goes is our spirit and our soul. That goes to heaven and our body is left here to to decompose, so to speak. Um, And uh, then when we, we get in the rapture or whether we've passed by way of the grave, you know, the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first during the rapture so they'll get their glorified body their glorious body and then we will get ours those who are left and remain will go up and get our glorified body which is is incorruptible praise God it will not decompose and it will not age praise God so we're excited about that and we will go to heaven where we will we will live for eternity in heaven, in the new heaven, in the new earth. And one thing that we need to understand, which we're talking about today, the title of my message, if you want to write it down, is hell is not for you. Uh, There is a, a literal hell and it's not a big party like some even uh, religions and some cults uh, really push and say it's going to be full of sex and it's going to be full of drugs and all kinds of things like that. It's not going to be that way. Um, and, and we need to be aware of that. This is going to be a place of torment. It's going to be a place of great stench and, and misery. And there will be a total absence of light because of the lack of the presence of God. And, and also it's going, it's called the, um, the utter darkness in one scripture, Jesus referred to it as you will be cast into utter darkness. And so I was thinking about that, how dark it really will be. And when I was, when I was a young um, and a teenager, we would come up from El Paso and we would go to Carlsbad Caverns. And at that point in time, they had, you know, a guy, a guide with the Smokey the Bear hat on, and he would guide you through and tell you about all the stalactites and all the stalagmites. And now they just have kind of a little um, machine that you can't even hear anything because it's scratchy. But nonetheless, uh, we would get down to the very bottom and we would sit there and they would tell us some more things and then they would turn out the lights. And I remember as a child that darkness, like it was utter darkness to me. I'm sure it's not as dark as hell is or the lake of fire, but just in my childlike mind, that was dark. And so that kind of, uh, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. I mean, it was just, you know, sometimes your eyes adjust in darkness. That didn't happen. It was just so utterly dark. And so that's the way hell is going to be. Um, What I've given you is a simple truth 
entitled the same as my message, Hell is Not for You. You can read this later. Uh, Pastor Dean wrote this years and years ago when we would take these um, simple truths they were called, uh, actually they were eight and a half by 11. We would roll them up and put them in little bags. <clears throat> and then on Saturday morning, a bunch of us would go and we would put them on uh, people's, uh, attach them to their, their door. And just so people would know, this was an, a way of outreach for us at the time um, to let people know that hell is not for you. And many of you know who come to uh, Or Nights we find that, that people don't understand the magnitude of hell. They don't understand. Flippantly, they say, when we ask them, um, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? What do they say? Many of them say hell. And they don't even know the consequences of what they were saying, nor what's going on when they, when they do get in hell. So that's why um, you can get some more of these to share them with people because I think that there's a reality of, of the end times. I mean, even unbelievers are kind of aware that something's going on and, and we're about to, to end this, in this thing. Uh, but prayerfully, this lesson on hell will kind of motivate you to be ever determined to tell people about Jesus and tell them that, that they don't have to choose to go there. They can choose life and they can choose heaven. And so we've got the answer. So uh, we, need to, we need to tell them. Um, we don't want them to, to regret their decision, <laughs> you know, because people in hell remember. They will remember those people that encouraged them to receive Jesus and they will remember, they will remember uh, and regret their decision not to receive Jesus. Um, so let's turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, and um, we're living in this reality right now of 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. It says, in whom the God of this world, who is Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So I want you to write two things down that the enemy blinds the minds of the people through human reasoning and through religion. These are the two things that we are up against human earthly reasoning and uh, human reasoning and religion and we're going to read this in a minute in 1 Corinthians 2 13 and 14 write that down 1 Corinthians 2 13 and 14 where we realize that that earthly reason and intellect are absolutely useless in understanding the things of God absolutely useless useless because they're spiritually discerned and that's what this scripture says this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 13 through 14 he said which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches but which the Holy Ghost teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned and so you can understand that this is why children even little ones are so open to the things of God. They're quick to receive Jesus and they're quick to understand the things of the Spirit. Why? Because they have, their minds have not been blinded by education or the things of the world, which really seeks really to remove all traces of God and the Bible from their thinking. And so it's important that we realize that that we're being inundated in, in education, in schools, in, in universities, everywhere with that, that concept to remove God and to replace it with natural reasoning and intellect. In fact, I just read the other day that um, Harvard University has now a, he's called the chief chaplain. He's a new chief chaplain of Harvard University. That means he's over all the other chaplains. And so he is an atheist. He's an atheist. 
Now that sounds like an oxymoron, <laughs> but he's, he's the chief champ, chaplain. And what he wants to do is he says that there's, um, there's a group of people, which are the Jews. He wants to unify the Jews, the Hindus, the Buddhists, all these other religious organizations and cults um, who do not uh, embrace any religious tradition. That's his motive. So that just goes to show you where we're going as a nation. We are going further and further and further away from the, the things of the spirit. The other mind binder blinder is religion. And we know that those of us who have been in religion, it seeks, seeks to give you a list of do's and don'ts without a relationship with, with Jesus. And then, an, then it also produces emotions disguised as a move of the spirit without the word as its foundation. And we have to be aware of this because these things are going to increase more as, as we get closer, closer to the end. Um, Brother Hagen always said that, that there has to be word and spirit. You can't have one without the other. And during the time of the healing revivals of the 70s, and he was part of that, and many other men were part of that who had tents and they went around and they, they had great healing signs and wonders and miracles. But Brother Hagen told them, he said, you have to have the word as your foundation. You just can't have this emotion that leads to signs and wonders and miracles without the foundation of the Word of God. And so as a result of that, all those other men died before he did. And so we have to understand what the enemy is using in our colleges, in our schools, and um, in even our churches to uh, blind the minds of believers to believe a different way and not be led by the Spirit of God. The Bible mentions hell 162 times in the New Testament alone. I think that's interesting. And um, Jesus uh, mentioned hell 70 times. In fact, Jesus spoke more about hell, if you study the scriptures, than he did of heaven. Uh, it's, it's sad to say that um, there was a two, 2016 survey found that 71% of Americans, and I know this is an old, old survey, but I couldn't find a recent one, found that 71% of Americans believe in heaven, 61% believe in hell, and only 20, 27% do not believe in the devil at all. So, you know, we've got our work cut out for us. The death rate, according to the scripture I read, or the census I read, not the scripture, um, is um, 120 per minute. So 120 people pass per minute. And when you um, figure that, multiply it times 60 for an hour, there are 7,200 people that pass every hour. So obvious, that's worldwide. So obviously we've got our work cut out for us, for our area, wherever we, we are, you online, we've got our work cut out for us. We've got to go and tell people the good news. We've got to tell somebody the good news about Jesus. And that's why I appreciate about what Pastor Rodney Howard Brown said, you know, make a commitment every day, every day to tell somebody about Jesus. You know, let it be something that's natural, not just when we gather for or nights or when we, when we think about it, but let's think about it every day. Let's think about it every day because hell is a real place and there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun and we don't want anybody to go to hell. And you have to realize that, that you know, there will be people who do go to hell, who make a choice, make a concerted decision and reject Jesus. But we want to believe what the word says that the fields are ripe unto harvest and that God will lead us to those fields that are ripe. So we don't, we don't stop, we just continue to go. So let's look at some scriptures about hell. Hell is a real place. 
turn in your Bible to Matthew 7, 13 through 14. This is what Jesus said, and this is in his Sermon on the Mount. If you read that, if you have a red letter edition, you can read that, and it's very long. His Sermon on the Mount um, in um, Matthew 6 and 7, but he says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. In other words, he's saying many go in this wide gate because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life and few there be that find it. Which is kind of telling us that there'll be more with him than there are with us. Uh, In Luke 16, it also talks about a literal hell. And this is where Jesus in verse 19, he said, now there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores and desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And it came to pass that the beggar died. So this is not a a parable. This is a real event that happened. And with real people. And what Jesus is doing is he's encouraging the people that, that um, death is not the end. You know, some people believe that. They believe that once you die, it's over. There's nothing, there's nothing else. And so he was encur- encouraging the people that their existence was not over, that there was more. So the story continues in verses 22, and it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23 and 28 says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. So this is another scripture reference to hell is torment. And sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. So that tells me it's hot in hell. For I am tormented in this flame. There are flames. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us. That would come from thence. Don't you love King James? <laughs> then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So, hell is a place of torment, agony, and despair. The rich man's torment was so intense that he believed just a single drop of water would bring him some relief. So, we can learn from this that one of the first things that is is happening in hell, based on the rich man, is that you will be thinking people who go to hell will be thinking about their friends and their family that need to hear the good news and need to be warned that they don't want to come here. And, you know, there's a lot of ifs. If only, if only I could go back. If only I could go back and tell them. And of course, Abraham knew that wouldn't do any good. You know, even today, there are lots of books written by people who have been taken to hell. And, and they've, they've written about the horrors of hell and what they saw in hell. But still, you know, for many, that doesn't make any difference. You see, it's a hard issue. People still have to choose. They have to choose. And prayerfully, when they hear the good news of the gospel, they will choose to go to heaven and not hell and make Jesus the Lord of their, their life. So 
in verses 29 and 31, it continues. Jesus says, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. The same is true today. You know, we're seeing this come to pass. We as believers have to get on the inside of our hearts, this, this fire that we gotta tell people about Jesus. We gotta tell them the horrors of hell. And I think there hasn't been, there aren't a lot of sermons on hell that really tell you exactly what's going on. People are oblivious, they don't know. They do think like it's a big party. It's a big sex um, time, orgy or whatever. But hell was not created. As bad as it is, it was not created for God's prized creation, which is you and I. It wasn't created for us. It was created for the devil and his, his fallen angels. And that's in Matthew 25, 41, if you write it, if you want to write it down. Every person has to make a choice. But, you know, one thing we have to understand is God, God will not override our free will. He will not make us choose. He's given us a choice. He's given us a free will to choose life or to choose death. Now, but God is faithful and I really believe he is. I believe to the the last breath of every person that God is working, trying to woo on their behalf, send laborers to minister the truth to them till they take their last breath because it's the heart of the father that nobody go to hell. That's how much he loves us. Amen. So hell in the Bible is a literal place. Uh, the Bible doesn't specifically give a geographical location of hell. There are some scriptures that talk about this. And, um, one of them is Isaiah 14, nine, and it says hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. So some people believe that hell is located under the earth. Some people believe based on these scriptures that hell is in the interior of the earth. Another scripture is in Luke 10, 15. And it says, and thou Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. In the New Living, it says down to the place of the dead. So it always, in scripture, if you study it out, it refers to heaven as being up and hell as being down. Another clue is in 1 Samuel 28, 7 through 19. And this was, was the story of King Saul we know that story. You know, he was such a great leader and he was such a great warrior, but his disobedience led him on a downhill spiral. And really the icing on the cake was when he, he needed direction. And Samuel, of course, had already died, the prophet that told him what to do. And instead of going to God to get direction, he went to a witch. Remember that story? And so in Luke 16, it tells us that no one comes back to earth um, because they're forever in one place or the other. So when he went to this witch, this witch called up a familiar spirit um, looking like Samuel. And of course, familiar spirits are deceiving. So it says that the witch called him up from the dead. So called him up again, up from um, uh, hell. Ephesians 4, 8, Paul says that Jesus ascended up on high and led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. In verse nine, it says again, now he that ascended what is it but he that also descended uh, first into the lower parts of the earth. So these are some clues as far as the geographical location of hell. Let's look at some facts about hell. 
Hell is a place of awareness and memory, just like the story in Luke 16, 19 through 31 with the rich man and Lazarus. The, the rich man, as you notice, as I read the story, he knew, he knew where he was and he knew who he was. And he recognized that Abraham was there and uh, he knew that he had stuff in that life and he recognized that in eternity in hell where he was, he didn't have any stuff. Um, so there's some sort of body that will be seen and recognized. Uh, and, and that's what happened there in that particular story that Jesus said. Number two, hell is a place of sorrow. Hell is a place of sorrow. And I know all the movies, all the, all the words can't really accurately describe the horrors of hell and how each person will feel because know that their mind and their spirit are what goes to hell. And so they have awareness of, of what they've, they've done and how they rejected Jesus. Second Samuel 22, six says, the sorrows of hell compass me about, the snares of death prevented me. So, I, I believe that people will recognize the missed opportunities they have had to receive Jesus. That's why, you know, some water, some plant, God gives the increase. We have to continue to sow. Even though there is rejection, we still continue to sow. We continue to go. We continue to tell. We just can't give up. Well, this person rejected me. <laughs> no, you continue to go. You continue to share the good news of the gospel because we don't want anybody to, to go to hell. Number three, hell is a place of captivity. See, when, when you have no knowledge of the word of God and what is available for you, then you are in captivity. You're in captivity to the world and to the devil. That's why we have to preach not only uh, a saving knowledge of the Son of God, but preach what is available through our covenant that we have with the Father, that we do have abundant life. So people can come out of darkness and, and habits and things that have held them in captivity and get freedom from that. And we know that freedom is only through Jesus and who the Son sets free is free indeed. So we want people to, to come out of that captivity. The scripture that supports this is Isaiah 5, 13 through 15. Isaiah 5, 13 through 15. And this is what it says. My people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. See, that's, that's what so many people have no knowledge. They have no clue why we come to church. They have no clue why we read the Bible. They have no clue about, about God and about Jesus and the plan that God has for mankind. It goes on to say, and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it and the mean man shall be brought down and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled proverbs 27:20 20 says hell and destruction are never full so the eyes of man are never satisfied number 4 fact about hell it's a certainty for those who reject Jesus. It definitely is, is their end if they do reject Jesus. In 2 Peter 2, 4 through 9, it says this. And I want you to listen to this. It says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, 
for that righteous man dwelling among us and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. See, God is love, but he's also just. He's also a just God. And if all of the wicked of the world were destroyed um, in Noah's time, in the time of Noah, what makes you think that you can live any way you want and, and escape judgment? So we can't. Number five, hell is a place that is void of all good. Because as we know, all good things come from God. Isn't that what James 1.17 says? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father. So everything that, that we enjoy, the fresh air, the clean water, the food, the sunshine, the beautiful flowers, the beautiful scenery, our relationships, all the pleasantries that we have, we will have in heaven. And they're not possible in hell. They're not possible in hell. Now let's look at various names of hell. Because as you read the Bible, you will see such terms as Gehenna, uh, which is a Greek word, and that is in the New Testament, and that's mentioned 13 times in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the, the term that is used is the Valley of Ben Hinnon, H-I-N-N-O-M. And that's found in Jeremiah 19, verses 2 through 5. You can read that. And this valley is an actual place. It's an actual place south of Jerusalem. And what, what would happen there, it was a place in ancient times of great wickedness. Great, great wickedness. And this is where babies were sacrificed to pagan gods. And men and women would bring their offspring and sacrifice their offspring. Can you imagine that? As a burnt offering. And uh, King Josiah ended this um, in 642 BC. He just stopped that. But now it is still an actual place. This is a valley. And this is a place where all the, the dead corpses are put. All the dead animals are put. All the trash. And so it's, it's just a, a smelly place full of maggots and fire. And so this kind of represents hell. It's going to stink. It's going to stink really bad. But um, we can see from this that... All during uh, ancient times, uh, people were sacrificing and killing babies. You know, uh, when Moses was hidden because of the, 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 the edict or the rule that all male babies should be killed, remember? And then again, when Jesus uh, was born, Herod uh, had a decree that all the babies should be born. We've carried out that plan. Uh, Satan has carried out that plan through willing people today with the number of abortions that we have, slaughtering babies. And we even know from, from current information that some of our higher-ups in government are involved in this uh, abortion and slaughtering babies um, and, and sacrificing uh, babies. There is so much demonic activity in our government. No wonder it's like it is. Um, and just to show you that evil is still so prevalent um, in, in our day and age, what happened, and we're going to put up a picture of this statue, um, and this is the statue of uh, Malik, and he's a pagan god, and this is what was used to sacrifice babies uh, in ancient times. And so in September 27th of 2019, the Catholic Church decided to make this exhibit and they put the exhibit in, in the, the front of the Colosseum in Rome. 
Now, number one, remember what the Colosseum in Rome was used for. It was used where there was a massive slaughter and, and giving to the lions, Christians, right? So in addition to that heroic, horrific event, then they put this, this uh, exhibit of this God that, that, that was used in ancient times to sacrifice babies. And so it is of some sort of metal. And what they did was they heated it up to where it was red hot and then the parents would put their babies in the arms of this of this pagan statue um, the catholic church thought it would be good for tourism so they did this uh, from september of 2019 to march of 2020 so for six months they were believing that all of these um um, tourists would, would enjoy that. Um, I think it is repulsive. Um, but you can go ahead and take that down. Notice the, the wings, you know, the, the devil perverts everything that, that, um, that God has just is, is kind of sick to think that people do that, but they're doing that today. So another name for hell is Hades, and that's the Greek word for hell. Uh, it's mentioned 10 times in the New Testament. It's always connected with death. In the Hebrew or the Old Testament, it is Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. Either way, they're one and the same. They both mean hell. Um, it's it's always referred to the definition. It's, it's not a final destination. It's a temporary place. Uh, Acts 2.2, 2, it was referred to a place of bodily decay that Jesus would not be going there like his body would not uh, decompose in, in Hades or hell. Um, so we have to understand how this came about and where this, this is. You see, in the, the bosom of Abraham or in the upper echelons of hell, there were two areas and there was paradise and there was Hades. And there was a great gulf in between, just like we read in Luke and Jesus spoke about. So in paradise or Abraham's bosom, remember Jesus turned to the, the thief on the cross next to him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. So all the righteous people who died before Jesus went to paradise. And just as we kind of read in uh, Ephesians, Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, he went and preached to those in paradise. He basically emptied out paradise, do you understand? But Hades is still there, and there's a great gulf uh, in between. We're going to give you a picture, or there's a picture of it that we're going to show you later. And so you have to understand that Jesus was the firstborn into heaven. So he was the first one to go to heaven. That's why every Old Testament saint went to paradise. Now, as we know, and we've talked about before, there is no more people going to paradise. You don't go to a place the Catholics believe purgatory. The Buddhists believe there's a holding tank that people go to when they die. And if they light enough candles or say enough prayers in the Buddhist uh, religion, then they can either uh, pray them out of that place. That is not scriptural according to the word of God. So um, we righteous people who pass from this earth go directly to heaven. Our soul and our spirit go to heaven. Um, the Bible says to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Well, you're going to be present with the Lord, which means master, owner, possessor, and controller, Lord Jesus or Lord Satan. And go to Hades, which is the basically the holding tank where everybody goes who are unrighteous. The wicked go there. Now, um, what will happen is at the great white throne judgment, then Hades, which is a temporary place or hell, if you want to call it that, temporary place, that will be uh, emptied. And all those people will go um, to heaven where the great 
white throne judgment will be. And so they will go there um, at that particular time. And we know their ultimate destination is to be cast into the lake of fire. But they have to go and they have to be judged. They have to be judged for all their deeds. And then they will be thrown and cast into the lake of fire for eternity where Satan is the, the false prophet, the, the beast, all the, the wicked people are and the fallen angels. So that kind of gives you an overview of the fact that, that hell or Hades is a temporary place. It specifically tells us this in Revelation 20, 13 through 14. It says, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them and they were judged every one of them according to their deeds then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Now, it's interesting that um, we have a, a, a picture or a graph of the underworld, and you can look at this. Prayerfully, you can read this. You can download it if you're online. But it kind of shows the great gulf. You can look up all the scriptures, the great gulf in, in paradise, between paradise and Hades or hell. And then you see that um, everybody who is in hell or Hades will go up to the great white throne judgment and then they will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, or Gehenna, the final hell, and those scripture references that you can look at there. Um, we, we don't want anybody to go to the lake of fire. It will be uh, worse than hell. You can look at your, your picture, your diagram, and see. Um, it's it's going to be full of uh, per, perpetual, endless uh, misery, torment, sorrow, stench, um, but that's the hell or Hades right now where people go, but that's not the final destination. As I said, the final destination is the lake of fire. And, and when it is emptied the, or Hades is emptied, they have to first, and they will get some sort of body to stand before the great uh, white throne judgment. Uh, Jesus will be the judge. Um, and so it, it appears that, that this uh, great white throne judgment will be in heaven when um, the, the fire is burning and recreating the new heaven and the new earth. So as you think about it, then those people will see in heaven standing before the great white throne judgment with Jesus as their judge, they will see what they're missing. We don't know the exact location of that, but, but we know that, that they will be um, cast into the lake of fire uh, after they are judged for all their deeds. Matthew 25, 3 says, uh, describes this as outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mark 9, 43 describes it as the fire that is not quenched. So we understand that there's some sort of fire there that is unlike our fire that we think of. Uh, even though we do have a picture of, and you can go ahead and put that up, picture of that somebody has depicted as far as the lake of fire, but there's no light there, so it will be some sort of fire that doesn't exert any light, and it will burn with fire and brimstone, and um, so this will be no relief. There will be no relief from the flames, and you can see how, um, how bad it is going to be. Um, there will be weeping, as I said, and gnashing of teeth. Um, so the lake of fire is what's going on in hell right now, magnified to a hundred times. I mean, it's, it's not a place we, we want anybody to go to. Revelation 20, 10, 10 says, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire, calls it fire and brimstone, 
where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented night and day forever. Night and day forever and ever. So you understand that fire, normal fire consumes something. It, it takes it, turns it to ashes. That will not be the case there. Those who have gone to hell say that they, they see people with their, their eyes, their sockets only, their flesh, you know, just hanging there, burning in torment, crying out. Um, there also is believed that there's degrees of punishment. Not all of us, not, not all of us, we won't be there, of course, but not all of the people who go there will be, have the same punishment. It will depend on the degree of, their, of what they did when they were on earth. Um, the, the books that, that are written about hell are just, are just more of the same thing that I've told you that there's misery, there is recognition, people crying out, help me, uh, people saying when, um, when the person went there, can't you help me? You know, where there is a mental awareness of what's going on. It is torture above all torture. And so this is why I really want you to understand the smell, the smell of burning flesh. Like we know that the smell of blood is absolutely horrible, but the smell of burning flesh is even worse. And so you can imagine that this is their eternal punishment. They won't be consumed. It will never stop. That will always be there, that eternal punishment. Um, in, in Revelation 21, 8, it describes the, the people who are to be thrown into the lake of fire. And it says the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And it's called in scripture, the second death. And so there's, there's no relief. There's no relief from the, um, the fiery flames. Continual torment, mind torment, because even though their, their body is not there, so to speak, they have their faculties and they will be tormented in their mind um, and just continually tormented. Now, um, there is a scripture, you know, in your diagram, you see that the lake of fire is down there in the lower regions of hell. But there is a scripture that is a little bit um, interesting in Revelation. If we go back to Revelation 14, 9 and 10, and I'll just read it to you because the location of this lake of fire is never given in scripture. But Revelation 14, 9 says, Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, and we've talked about that, the mark of the beast, which the world is preparing us for that right now. Uh, in Revelation 10, 14, 10, it says, He also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone, which we've already had scriptures that support that. They will be tormented with fire and brimstone. But then the last phrase in this verse in Revelation 14, 10 says, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. So uh, that's interesting uh, to see that maybe this could imply that the, the lake of fire is not below, but is up above. But um, all I have to say to that is, Sila, think about that. Uh, we're not going to be concerned because we're not going there. But if it's in the presence of the the holy angels and presence of the lamb, uh, the lamb and the holy angels are not in hell. <laughs> Do you understand? So what we, we know for sure is we don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. We don't want anybody to go there. And um, 
We want people to be aware of their eternal destiny and, and their choice that they have a choice and we want them to choose life. We want them to choose Jesus. Um, that's why Matthew 28, 19 through 20, you know, it goes full circle. Jesus, when he left, he gave us these instructions in Mark, Mark uh, 16 and in Matthew 28. And, and he didn't give these instructions flippantly so we could say, oh, that's, that's, that's for the preachers or that's for the missionaries, that's for other people. No, this is for us. This this is for each one of us to go into our world. And notice it says, make disciples, not just converts. Yes, we want people to acknowledge Jesus from their heart and pray the prayer and get saved, Romans 10, 10 9 and 10. But we also want them to grow up and be discipled, which is a taught one. And we're responsible for inviting them to church, inviting them, paying for them to take deep so they can grow up in the things of God. It's our job. It's our job to do this. Um, Deuteronomy 30, 19. We all know this scripture. Um, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. We want to choose life every day. And we want to live our life as an example. But we also, in addition to that, part of that is not just for us. It's not all about us. It's all about God's plan and his spirit working through us to tell people the good news. So my prayer is that we're all encouraged today that, that hell is not a place that we want to go. Um, if, if you want more of those hell is not for you tracks, simple truth, then, then have them available so, so you can tell people who say, you know, I'm going to hell very flippantly. No, you don't want to go to hell because you don't understand. Hell is not a party. Hell is horrible. And there are horrors in hell. So um, I pray you've learned something today. This kind of ends our whole uh, series on um, revelation and, and what's going to be coming down the pike.